If you have your copy of the scripture, will you turn with me to Romans chapter 13? We're going to be in verses 1 through 7 this morning. There is an old adage, and I am sure that you have probably heard it, that one does not discuss religion or politics in polite company. Now, the reason for this rule of etiquette is to avoid those awkward and contentious conversations that occur around the holiday table with that crazy uncle that you have. I mean, we all know who it is, and if you don't, it might be you. But the, the point is that we do have this idea that we are not to discuss these things. I have to tell you, I really dislike that old adage, and I'll tell you why. I believe when we tell people that you do not discuss religion and politics, all that it accomplishes is that we are unable to discuss religion or politics in a civil manner with one another when we disagree. And we will disagree from time to time. But if you consider the current cultural climate, then I think you will concur that, that this old adage has caused us to be people who do not discuss or even debate politics, but rather we yell at one another over politics and we treat one another with either disgust or distrust and it doesn't matter who they are. Well, brothers and sisters, you might think that this is a relatively new phenomenon, but it's actually quite old. C.S. Lewis recognized it in his book, The Screwtape Letters, and he describes uh, in that book the correspondence between an older, more experienced demon named Screwtape and his nephew Wormwood, who was a young demon just getting started in the unholy business. But uh, it, it's, a it's a fictional account. I think you probably recognize that. Uh, and in this book, he's writing from the point of view of a demon. So bear that in mind as I share this excerpt with you. So when Screwtape describes the enemy, he's speaking of God. Okay, so, so bear that in mind. He's not speaking of Satan. He's speaking of God here. All extremes, ex except extreme devotion to the enemy, are to be encouraged. Not always, of course, but at this period. Some ages are lukewarm and complacent, and then it is our business to soothe them yet faster asleep. Other ages, of which our present is one, are unbalanced and prone to faction, and it is our business to inflame them. Now understand that at this time, when Lewis is writing this book, it's in the context of Great Britain in the middle of World War II. So bear that in mind. We want the church to be small. Not only that fewer men may know the enemy, but also that those who do may acquire the uneasy intensity and the defensive self-righteousness of a secret society or clique. The church herself is, of course, heavily defended, and we have never yet quite succeeded in giving her all the characteristics of a faction, but subordinate factions within her have often produced admirable results. And then Screwtape goes on to describe the difference between pacifism and patriotism in a time of war. And then he continues, whichever he adopts, your main task will be the same. Let him begin by treating the patriotism or the pacifism as a part of his religion. Then let him, under the influence of partisan spirit, come to regard it as the most important part. Then quietly and gradually nurse him onto the stage at which the religion becomes merely part of the cause in which Christianity is valued chiefly because of the excellent arguments it can produce in favor of the partisan position. The attitude with which you want to guard against is that in which the temporal affairs are treated primarily as material for obedience. Once you have made the world an end and faith a means, you have almost won your man. And it makes very little difference what kind of worldly end he is pursuing. Provided that meetings, pamphlets, policies, movements, causes, and crusades, and to that we might add today news and social media, matter more to him than prayers and sacraments and charity, he is ours. And the more religious on those terms, the more securely ours. 
Lewis had the ability to drill right down to the heart of the matter. And it didn't matter if it was 1942 when he authored this book and published it, or if it is today, what he explains there is so relevant to us. This morning, we are beginning a new sermon series, Examining Christian Citizenship. And I have to tell you, this is a series that I have wrestled with for a long, long time, years, in fact, because I believe that the church has not done the best job discipling her people on this topic. Why? Because you do not discuss religion or politics in polite company. Well, we're going to discuss religion. We're the church, right? But politics we have put off for a number of reasons. And we're going to talk about some of those this morning and through the course of this series. But we must, in this day and age, understand what the relationship is between the church and the state and how we as believers are to live in both. So will you honor the reading of God's word this morning as we stand together and read these seven verses from the book of Romans. The apostle Paul under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit wrote to the church in Rome, let every person be subject to the governing authorities for there is no authority except from God and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them, Taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. O Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth it contains that applies to every aspect of our lives. And Father, we thank you that you have not left out the realm of politics from your divine instruction. Father, I pray this morning that we would examine our own hearts that we would examine our own viewpoints and where they have digressed from scripture, no matter in what direction that may be, that we would come back in line with your holy word and your holy command. We ask this for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and he who is the King of Kings. Amen. Well, before we dig into the meat of our topic this morning, I need to take a few moments to dispel some misconceptions about uh, politics. And, And sometimes these misconceptions are held by believers. Sometimes they're held by unbelievers, but they can cloud the discussion. And so we're gonna move through these rather quickly, but I need to be clear on these before we jump in to a matter that is so misunderstood. First of all, there is the very nature of politics itself. When I taught political science, I would begin every semester by discussing what the definition of politics is. And often I would begin by saying there are a lot of people who take the view of Dave Barry, who was a syndicated humor columnist with the Miami uh, Sun, I believe, or the Miami Herald, I don't remember the exact name of the paper, but he was in Miami. And Dave Barry said that you can understand the meaning of politics by breaking it down into its parts. Poly, meaning many, and ticks, meaning blood-sucking creatures. (laughs) Now that's a rather cynical view, isn't it? It's a rather cynical view. And then I would tell my students, that's one way to view it. And that's the way a lot of people do. But you don't have to. Because politics in and of themselves in and of itself, it's not evil. Politics is simply who gets what, when, and how. 
That is the simplest definition I can give you of politics. Who gets what, when, and how? What do I mean by that? Essentially what I mean is how are public resources allocated? How do we live together in a society? How do we administer justice and, and how is authority to be distributed and, and from where does it originate? Those are the things that politics answers. But when we start talking about Christian politics, I love the way that Patrick Schreiner, who is a professor at Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, put it. He said, Christian politics concerns how we integrate our confession that Jesus is Lord with our call to love our neighbors. That's Christian politics. Jesus is Lord and we're to love our neighbors. Well, governments and institu are, are essentially institutions that we establish to oversee these questions, but there is and has always been a tension between uh, the, those who, who fill human government and those who follow God. There's a tension there. There always has been. And there's been a tendency over the history of humanity for the government to enforce a specific religion. You go through the history of the world and you will see that some kind of religion has been required by the governing authorities. That is the typical way of doing things. It's only been within the last hundred years or so, a couple hundred years, that that has changed. In terms of Christianity, we see this tendency go back all the way to the Emperor Constantine in the 300s AD. But the question here is simply this, which religion, which sect? Which denomination will be the one that is enforced by government? War after war has been fought over these questions, and war continues to be fought even today over these questions. But when it comes to Christianity, the idea of compelling someone at the point of the sword to follow the faith is inconsistent with what we read about the faith in God's word. On the other hand, we do see some arguing for the government to exclude religion from public life, often as a result of the history of the compulsion that we just considered. Those who hold this position, and, and let's be honest, we see a lot of that today, don't we, in our culture. We see a lot of people such as organizations like Freedom From Religion. There's, there's groups like that. Well, they argue that there should never be any public expression of faith, any faith, by governments or those who are in government. There should be no prayers before city council meetings, no nativity scenes on the town square, no crosses or stars of David on military headstones in military cemeteries. This is the position that you're free to believe whatever you want in your home or in the pew of your church but you may never take it out of those environs. It must remain there. But the problem with this is that such a position requires one to compartmentalize that which is not compartmentalizable. You cannot do that because your faith, your worldview is integral to who you are and how you will act outside of your home and your church. So this tension has led some to adopt the position that they will simply not engage in politics whatsoever. They will never do so. But if government is the God-ordained institution, and this passage that we are studying this morning, as well as other passages of Scripture and the entirety of Scripture, declares unequivocally that it is so, then this cannot be an option, no matter how spiritual it may sound. Sometimes we like to couch it in, oh, I'm so spiritual, I never get involved in politics. I only get involved in my faith. Scripture doesn't give you that option. Your faith must involve and, and inform everything about your life. But ultimately, when the church adopts that position, then it is implicitly surrendering to the argument of the exclusion of faith from the government. When you privatize your faith to such a degree that you will never engage in the political process, 
That is something more than what scripture recognizes as a legitimate option for believers. So to refuse to be involved in the political process is to proclaim that the truth Jesus is Lord only applies as far as the human heart individually and nothing else. Brothers and sisters, may I suggest that when Jesus says he is Lord, he is Lord over all, all creation. And there is not a square inch over which Jesus does not declare that it is his. Now, of course, others have reversed this. And, you know, we as humans are quite adept at this, aren't we? We like to go from one extreme to the other. We never quite seem to find the rational middle. But others have elevated politics above the faith. And this extreme is not the exclusive domain of either the left or the right. Both sides do this. And they do it just like we saw in the screw tape letters. They subjugate the faith as a means to their preferred partisan ends. So for those who are on the left, it is about a social gospel. For those who are on the right, the far right, I'm talking far left, far right, it's Christian nationalism, right? These are the two sides, far ends, but these are both perversions of the gospel because they seek to exchange the transcendent and transformational power of the kingdom of God for the impermanent and impotent earthly kingdom. That is what is happening in these situations. But finally, one last misconception that we have to consider often arises within the church, especially the Western church, is that government is just evil. Government's evil. You've probably heard this. Maybe you even believe it. But this is, this is a different position, I think, from understanding that government is a powerful entity that must be under checks and balances. There's, this is a different mentality that government is just evil. The founding father and fourth president, James Madison, wrote in the Federalist number 51, it may be a reflection of human nature that such devices should be necessary to control the abuses of government. But what is government itself but the greatest of all reflections on human nature? If men were angels, no government would be necessary. How true that is. And if angels were to govern men, neither external nor internal controls on government would be necessary. In framing a government which is to be administered by men over men, the great difficulty lies in this. You must first enable the government to control the governed, and in the next place oblige it to control itself. Do you see the wisdom of our founding fathers? This is absolutely brilliant, and it understands the human condition and our place in it. And Paul, in our passage from Romans, does not allow Christians to look at government as evil in and of itself. In fact, he declares it to be a gift given by God to a fallen world. So government is not evil in and of itself, even though it may be abused. So, with all of that said, we can also go so far as to say that government is not allowed to do whatever it wants, whenever it wants, however it wants. There are biblical parameters on government. And scripture declares what that role is to be. Now listen, there are many theories about what constitutes the best form of government. Just as there's many theories about what is the best form of economics or what is the best conference in college football, although that's the SEC and we all know that to be true. But as people of the book, as people of the book, we affirm that the government that governs best is the one that governs according to the parameters ordained by God. So let's consider what the government is to do, as we have seen it declared in our passage this morning. Fundamentally, government receives and wields authority directly from God. We see that in verse 1. Look there with me again. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Now in a moment we'll consider this submission, but for now I just want you to understand Paul's reasoning for why we are called to submit to the governing authorities. Their authority derives from and has been ordained by God himself. Do not miss this point. 
all authority, all authority in heaven and on earth originates in God, is given by God, and one day will be returned to God. That is the truth of Scripture. And so it goes without saying that not every government acknowledges this, right? We can look around the world and see many governments that do not believe that their authority comes from God. And in fact, ours may not have that position either. That's a whole other story. But one day, every governing authority will give an account to God for how it operated in the power it was given. And the authority they possess is a real authority and we are in general to be subject to it. Because to rebel against those authorities is to rebel against the one who gave that authority. That's what we see here. Look at verse two because there are consequences for the disobedience. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment. Now, Paul goes on to explain that the governing authorities he mentions in verse 1 are to use that power for rewarding good and punishing evil. That's verses 3 and 4. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. This makes sense. Because if the good and sovereign God has delegated authority to earthly governments, then those earthly governments have a responsibility to pursue the revealed will of God in his moral law to reward good and punish evil. And so when the governing authorities are acting justly in this regard, then those who are doing what is good have no fear of the one who is in authority. Now we'll consider in a moment what the believer's responsibility is when the laws are evil, when government goes in a direction that is not permitted by God. But for now, we should recognize that it follows from these verses that government is to use their God-ordained authority to serve and protect its citizens. That's also here in these verses. That means the government must clearly define what is good and it must clearly define what is evil and it must not mix the two up. It must wield its authority against those who seek to do evil. Laws are to reflect this. That is their purpose. It's to offer incentives or rewards for doing what is good and consequences or punishments for what is evil. And those laws must be equally applied to all citizens regardless of whatever power they might have in the society, whether wealth or political power, whatever the case may be. The laws are to apply equally to everyone. That is something that we say in the U.S. system of government, right? We are a government of laws, not men. We don't respect individuals before the law. Everyone stands equal before it. Now, to what end we are successful in that is a whole other question. But that is what we should seek to be doing. Now, governments have these responsibilities because they represent God as a servant. That's verse 4, the end of verse 4. And then later, in verse 6, Paul even goes on to say the authorities are the ministers of God. Whether the official, whether the governing official is a totalitarian dictator or an absolute monarch, or a representative who has been elected by the people, or a low-level bureaucrat. They all wield authority that has been given to them by God, and they are therefore the servants of God. It does not matter what position they hold. And they have been put in their positions to do the will of God by rewarding what is good and punishing what is evil. Proverbs 8, 15 and 16 says, by me kings reign and rulers decree what is just. By me princes rule 
We are having some technical difficulties here. By me, princes rule and nobles, all who govern justly. So as with any servant, they may be faithful or they may be faithless. And and they carry out their duties in one of those two ways. But regardless of whether they're faithful or whether they're faithless, they do so as servants of God. And so even the most atheistic, totalitarian regime exists only because God has ordained it to be so. And he will call to account each one of them for how they have abused their authority. So seeing what government is to do, let's now consider what government is not to do. Because we can infer those things from this passage. First of all, government must never present itself as the savior of humanity. Listen, governments have been instituted, as we've seen, for rewarding good and punishing evil and establishing the conditions in which humanity may flourish. But government can never, never address our most pressing condition because it is powerless to do so. And that condition is a heart that is dead in sin. That is the most fundamental and pressing issue facing every person in every place at every time in the history of the world. It doesn't matter if they are in North Korea. It doesn't matter if they are in Iran. It doesn't matter if they are in Great Britain or they are in the United States. The dead human heart due to sin is the most pressing condition they have and government cannot save them. Only the gospel of Jesus Christ has the power to save. Now listen, government may be successful in behavior modification that's what the laws do right but it is never successful in heart transformation it cannot be so because a heart transformation is a miraculous work of the holy spirit in that individual's life but that has not stopped certain governments from presenting themselves as the savior of humanity some have done so But I am here to tell you that all of those governments combined have a batting average of zero. None of them have ever been successful in saving one individual. Because salvation comes only by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone. That is why Psalm 146.3 declares, Put not your trust in princes in a son of man in whom there is no salvation. But governments must also never confuse good and evil. When governments recognize the source of their authority, they are far more likely to get good and evil right. When governments recognize that their authority is derived from God, they are far more likely to get God's moral law right. But when they confuse what the source of their authority is, then moral confusion in the society is the inevitable result. You cannot be confused about God and get morality right. It is not possible. And so the prophet Isaiah warned those who would dare transpose these things in Isaiah 5.20. You probably know this passage. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. And although Paul does not address what a believer is to do in these situations, other passages of scripture do, and we'll look at those in just a moment. But before we do, I wanna share with you one more thing the government must not do, and that is define and dictate matters of the faith. The dangers of these actions became evident very early in the history of the church. If you go back to the Emperor Constantine in the 300s AD, you discover just how dangerous it can be for the government to dictate to the church how it should believe and how it should act. You see, in the early 300s, there was a controversy that arose over the question of whether Jesus was eternally God or not. And some had started to proclaim that Jesus, albeit different from everybody else, was still a created being. He was the first created being, the most important created being, but of a different substance than God. 
And the man who advocated this was a man by the name of Arius, who was a presbyter in Alexandria, Egypt. Well, this created quite the commotion among the churches. And the emperor Constantine, who had recently converted to Christianity, decided to call all the bishops together in a church council in 325 in the city of Nicaea. And so all of them come together and they start to talk about this. Now, Constantine presided over the council of Nicaea as emperor of the Roman Empire. He did not vote. But you know that if the emperor says, this is what I think, it's going to influence the people who are there. And that's exactly what happened because Constantine initially supported Arius. He initially wanted Arius' view to take hold in the church. But thanks to Athanasius and Nicholas, orthodoxy won the day. And we can say we are not Arians. We do not believe that there's only the Father and everybody else is subordinate to him. Okay, this is what happens, though, when the church defers to the state when it comes to how the faith is defined and how its observant is dictated. Because the state will always seek to bend the faith to its own desires. That is what the state does. And so the church must never surrender any of this. Indeed, the state has often exercised its authority to persecute certain branches of Christianity, not to mention non-Christian religions, that it saw as a threat to its power. This has been the case throughout all of human history. This is not a isolated incident. And though it may seem unbelievable to us in the 21st century, when Southern Baptists are the largest Protestant denomination in the world, there was a time when Baptists were the targets of such persecution. And as a result, Baptists have always held as a distinctive part of their beliefs a separation between church and state and an emphasis on religious liberty. But does that mean that the wall of separation between church and state is impregnable as the Supreme Court ruled in the 1800s that it is to be built high and strong and be impregnable? I argue that it does not. Although if you do follow 20th century jurisprudence in the United States, it would be hard to come away with any other conclusion. But the term, the wall of separation between church and state, is not found in any governing document of the United States. It is not found in the Declaration of Independence. It is not found in the Constitution of the United States. So where do we get this term? What is the origin of it? Well, it goes back to the early 1800s when a group of Baptists who formed the Danbury Baptist Association in Connecticut wrote to then president, newly elected president, Thomas Jefferson. You see, they were concerned because there was no protection for religious liberty in the Connecticut state constitution. And the Connecticut government, although it allowed the Baptists to meet and to worship, said they did so as a favor. Well, listen, what the government gives, the government can take away, right? We understand that. And so the Danbury Baptist said, we don't believe that's right. We believe we have the right, an inalienable right, to worship God according to the dictates of our consciences. And Thomas Jefferson wrote back to them, and he said, don't worry, there is a protection for religious liberty in the federal constitution. And he said that the First Amendment had built a wall of separation between church and state. Now, the First Amendment, as it regards religious liberty, does have two clauses. There's what's called the free exercise clause, which says that you will be allowed to worship without interference from the government. And the establishment clause, which says the government will never establish a state religion. Those two aspects are very important there. But that does not mean that religion should never have an influence in the public square or the public life. It simply means that the government is to remain neutral towards religion and protective of its expression. That is what the First Amendment promises us. 
So getting this relationship correct is crucial for living out the truth of God's word here in our passage this morning. So the church must never take up the sword, and Caesar must never enter the pulpit. It is not the place of the church to wield the authority of the sword to punish evildoers. The church is an embassy of the kingdom of God, to be certain, but the purpose is not to exercise the authority granted to the government in the punishment of those who are wrongdoers, as Paul says in our passage. Now listen, there will come a time, there will come a time, and we pray it soon, that King Jesus returns. And when King Jesus returns, his saints will rule with him, and all the earthly governments of the world will be no more because their purpose will be fulfilled when Christ returns. They will be needed no longer and that government will be perfect and it will be exactly right in everything. But until then, until then, we as Christians, we as the church, are to be bringing people into the kingdom through the proclamation of the gospel. We're to point people to the only rescue for sin that is Jesus Christ. That's our job. He paid our debt on the cross. And so the government must never enter the pulpit. The government must never come into the church and tell the church how it is to proclaim the gospel. It is not to examine, approve, condemn, or in any way exercise oversight when it comes to what the church proclaims. Because government has neither the authority nor the expertise to insert itself into matters of doctrine and devotion. It is not equipped to do so. It is not empowered to do so. And it is not uh, 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 expert to do so. So the church's purpose is not to wield the sword. But that doesn't mean that the church is to abstain from the political process. The church can and must influence politics. Did you hear me? The church can and must influence politics. The fact that Paul is writing about how the church is to relate to the governing authorities in the world underscores the fact that we are to have an influence on that governing authority. And Paul is not the only one in the New Testament to write these things. Peter does so in his first letter as well. Our faith must impact how we evaluate issues and how we evaluate candidates for office in our system of government where we have the ability to elect our representatives. And for those to whom God has called them to serve in government, then passages like this one this morning is a sobering reminder of what God expects from those who hold these positions. Despite the public statements of some, you cannot neatly and cleanly divide your fundamental worldview that is inherently theological from your decisions, actions, and intentions. You can't say privately, I believe this, but publicly, I support the opposite. No, The truth is, this is what you privately believe too. What you publicly do is what comes out of your heart. Okay? So you can couch it over here and you can dress it up in certain language, but at the end of the day, it's what you do that reflects what you believe. And so the church must, must influence politics. The church has a prophetic voice in our culture. And we must exercise it. We must use it to proclaim the gospel and declare what is right. What's more, the church can and must submit to the legitimate laws that are put into place by the government. So what constitutes a legitimate law? Well, according to our passage this morning, we can say it is one that does not contradict the moral laws of God. Look at what Paul goes on to say in verses 5 through 7. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. 
pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, and honor to whom honor is owed. I want you to notice what happens when we rebel against the legitimate authority exercised by government authorities. God's wrath. That is what we incur. And we incur God's wrath through the sword that is wielded by those authorities. Now listen, we love to split hairs here, don't we? We love to debate over and over what is a legitimate law. And I certainly have my views on what is the best form of government. And I have my views on what is the best form of economic policy. And I have my views on what is the best criminal policy. And I have my views on what is the best educational policy. I try to inform my views on the basis of scripture. But these are my views. And I may disagree with any given administration's policies, but at the end of the day, if they do not contradict God's moral law, I am subject to the governing authorities, as Paul says in verse 1. And that means I must pay to all what is owed to them. I am subject to this because I am subject to the sovereign God who gave that authority to the governing authorities in the first place. And if he gave that authority to them, I am subject to to them. But that obligation to submit ends when the laws violate God's moral laws. And in those cases, the church can and must resist evil laws. We see one such case in Acts chapter 4, verses 18 and 20. Just to give you a little bit of the backdrop there, Peter and John have been brought before the Sanhedrin. Why? For nothing more than proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they were brought before the governing authorities of the Jews, the Sanhedrin. And this is what they said. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Um, and, and it goes on to say, but Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and what we have heard. Peter and John were told, don't say a word about Jesus. Don't say a word to anyone. And Peter and John said, whether we're to obey you or obey God, you guys figure that out, but we're gonna keep telling people about Jesus. You can't stop us no matter what. In fact, Peter and John even understood that if the state or the governing authorities did the worst thing possible, take their life, their testimony would be even stronger and their message would be heard even louder. That is what we see here. So when the law calls what is evil good and what is good evil, the church must speak with grace, love, clarity and resoluteness and brothers and sisters those are not contradictory terms we must do so declaring the truth of God's word but I want you to hear me very clearly such proclamation is not costless there is a price that will be paid for standing firm on the truth of God's word if you don't believe me consider the examples of John the Baptist when he spoke about the immorality of one of the Herods. Think about Paul and Peter as they preached the gospel of the kingdom of Christ in Rome. Think about the apostle James at the hands of another Herod or Jesus himself at the hands of Pilate. The servants are not greater than the master. And if they did this to him, they will do it also to you. We must understand that. But if we are persecuted for standing firm for the gospel, then as 1 Peter 4, 16, and then verse 19 declares, yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. And I assure you, if you have entrusted your soul to your faithful creator, then no authority on earth can do anything to you. 
We're just skimming the surface here. There's a lot to consider in this topic. And it is my prayer that as we move through this series, we would better understand, one, the purpose of government as it has been instituted and ordained by God, and two, what our role is as citizens of the kingdom of God and sojourners on this earth. Will you pray with me? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have instituted and ordained government. And Father, you know how hard that is for me to say. You know the depths of my heart. You know my rebelliousness. But Father, I thank you that by the Holy Spirit and your word, you are sanctifying all of me and you are sanctifying your people as well when we study your word and apply it to our lives. Father, I pray this morning that where maybe our toes have been stepped on, that we would take a moment to consider what your word says. And Father, if there's anything that I have said that's contradictory to the word, then I pray I'm corrected. But Father, you know that I strive to, to proclaim the word clearly and rightly divide it for your people. Lord, as we go out from here, I pray that we do not have an attitude of cynicism and jadedness towards those governing authorities that you have instituted over us for our good even when those governing authorities have taken directions that we know are evil. Father, may we use our prophetic voice, may we speak the truth of your word. And Father, if that means persecution, then let us rejoice in your name. Because we have been counted worthy to endure it. Lord, we thank you for this time, and, and I pray, Father, that if there's anyone here who has been trusting in something other than you, whether it's government or their good deeds, to bring them salvation, that today would be the day that they turn to Christ. And so, Father, as we close with our final hymn, and I am down here at the front, I pray that they would come and that they would turn their lives over to you and submit themselves to the King of kings and the Lord of lords, Jesus Christ. We ask this in his name and for his glory. Amen.